travel back with me to ancient Greece and think of the greatest thinkers of our time. Someone may come to mind, could be Pythagoras. Imagine him debating openly with the ancient philosophers, mathematicians, astronomers, artists. The problem is that's largely a myth. Hi, I'm Emily. I am working with Dr. Graham Lau, looking at science communication. And I'm trying to see how science communication works today in the modern time. It seems that as scientists, we want to share what we have to study. I mean, we're really excited about our research, so why wouldn't we want to talk about it? We're not trying to be secretive like Pythagoreans who were sworn to not divulge their geometric proofs. But we're still having some trouble getting through to some people. And I noticed this when I was going from school to home on vacations and, and going back for the semester. I was straddling these two pretty different ideologies. At home, it was more conservative, and at school, it was definitely more left-leaning. And I felt like neither side really knew the other existed or talked to each other much. And when this came up in science, it was especially disheartening. As a scientist, like I said, we wanna share what we're working on. And it can get pretty frustrating too when you're met with skepticism or even outright denial. In the US, this feels like a huge issue, but it's also a global one, especially, we, especially when we talk about climate change and the partisan divide there. We can see it in uh, pretty large economies across the world. So it's influencing a lot of big decisions that are being made. And I tried looking on the internet for some semblance of a conversation on this topic. I Googled scientist debate. And what did I find? Scientist versus philosophy. Scientist versus religion. Scientist takes on the biggest questions of the universe. Why are Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye the science guy debating such nebulous concepts like consciousness, as cool as it is, when we really need them doing the heavy lifting? And sure, you may not find so many scientists that are so skeptical of global warming, but why not open it up to the audience then and bring that dialogue to the forefront? So in science communication, we have the deficit model, which is this idea that I, the scientist, know a lot of stuff and I'll share it with you because maybe you don't know the research I do. And there are two avenues we could take with this. There's the explanation model, and the consensus gap model. So with the explanation model, I'll take you through my experiment. Step by step maybe, you'll see exactly what I saw unfolding. And with the consensus gap, it's a little different. You're gonna reassure people that this scientific phenomenon that can seem contentious or complicated, a lot of scientists actually agree on. But what happens when someone in the audience feels like they're not fully buying into it. The consensus gap model is great for communicating to large audiences, for organizing people behind a common cause. But it's been shown in some research to embolden skeptics when they feel unheard or unaddressed. And honestly, both approaches could lead to a sort of shouting match or one-sided conversation when we're not really listening enough to the people, to our audience who's involved. So I went back on the internet and did another search on the climate change debate, one of the bigger science debates out there. And I found this pretty popular video from PragerU. It's a right-leaning media site and they cover some science. In this video, Alex Epstein, a fossil fuels expert and uh, policy uh, researcher or investigator, discusses Dr. John Cook's 2013 research paper that says 97% consensus exists on humans being the cause of global warming. So I looked through the internet. I noticed some visceral reactions myself watching this, but I wanted to see what the skeptics had to say in 
comment sections, articles, blog posts. I really scoured the internet this time and I noticed three common responses from skeptics. The first, well, I'm not stupid. Don't talk to me like I am. Two, this actually feels like anti-science. And three, this is way too authoritarian for me. So the first one, when people say I'm not stupid, I've seen that the consensus gap model can sound kind of condescending to some. And the source of that is people want to be given the materials to learn. They'll say, give me the information, give me the primary sources. And in religious circles, common with uh, more of the conservative side, there is some science communication research showing that they pull on this scriptural inference practice of taking a primary text like the Old Testament, New Testament, Quran, and they'll look at that text to cite their arguments or formulate stories around that. So people are craving those primary sources. The second response is people asking, show me this consensus process that you're talking about. President Bush started the National Climate Assessment, which releases a consensus report every four years. It goes through six drafts. The second to last draft, the fifth one, it's open to public comment where people can post and then they get responses about it. And then in the sixth final draft, the National Association of Sciences deliberates and prepares their final consensus report. The only thing is those deliberations are behind closed doors. For fair reasons, there's some arguments made that if they were to keep the deliberations open, it could undermine the final decision. People could question the, the final decision and, and even question the legitimacy of the deliberation process just because some doubts were expressed. So it could also build mistrust and we have to assess the pros and cons there. So they decided that keeping it that part behind closed doors is what's best for now. And lastly, this feels way too authoritarian. So this list on the left was released on NASA's website. And they thought, well, if we just show them how many different organizations agree on this, I mean, they'll see how many people are behind global climate change as a human caused phenomenon. And they compiled a list of 18 scientific associations. I think it backfired. Some people responded with, surely not all of these groups can be the experts. Who are the climate scientists? From those consensus reports, there's also a year later released a referral, uh, a risk assessment. So the consensus report is supposed to be descriptive. The risk assessment is more prescriptive, ideas on how to move forward. And people have commented that they think this descriptive consensus report should just be limited to the experts, the climate scientists. And then for the prescriptive part, the next steps, we should bring in different scientists. So perhaps bringing in more people into the conversation created more distrust. So what I've done is I've reached out to uh, Mr. Epstein and to Dr. Cook. I followed up on my emails and we're scheduling a time to talk. So we'll see what they have to say, but I have some questions to ask them and some ideas on next steps, ways we can move forward and come together on this conversation. And hopefully we can open up the dialogue so that science can be more transparent and we can engage more people than Pythagoras ever did. Thanks. Fantastic, bravo. Very inspiring presentation. Does anybody have any uh, questions for Emily?
Well, I'll jump in. Um, one, I, I love that you are reaching out to both of them to ask them questions. I think you, you should make sure that everyone knows you're not talking to both of them together at the same time. This um, is true, <laughs> yeah. Which might be a harder conversation to, to try to moderate or lead. Um, so I, and I'm, I'm really proud to have a chance to work with you in this project. Um, so I'll ask you a tangential question, something kind of a little different. Uh, what do you think about the current publication model, uh, especially with the fact that, that usually scientists have to pay to have their research published and usually journals charge the public to read articles? Uh, how do you feel that that kind of falls into this realm of, of transparency issues in science? Well, it's interesting question because I don't think a lot of people who have qualms with the science, uh, the global climate change debate, I don't know how many of them are looking at scientific papers because a lot of those conversations I saw were, uh, well, citing those papers in a blog post, but they really got into it in the comment section and people aren't linking there. There's more going back and forth. I do think that science is shifting to being more open uh, in publication. I know like at my university, they just ended their contract with a really big publisher. So I think the tide is shifting, which means we're going in a positive direction because it's opening up to more people. Um, but yeah, I, that's another interesting thing to look into that I, I will, I'll try to find is how many people are actively searching for those papers because that 97% um, consensus that first came that really blew up not when uh, Dr. John Cook released it but when I think President Obama included it in a tweet and then people were upset that he like misphrased or perhaps it was John Kerry or maybe both of them but there was uh, people took issue with the phrasing. So I think social media complicates it, no matter how open or not the science is. Once it's unleashed, it takes on a life of its own. Yeah, social media is a new power to communicate science. You're in good hands with Graham. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm just curious, how many times did it take you to email them before they actually replied? Actually, they were more responsive than I thought they would be. Um, I got in touch with Dr. Cook, not even planning to talk to him directly. Uh, he has a website called skepticalscience.com and I had a different project idea. So I reached out to the general info contact and he responded. And then uh, Dr. or not Dr. Mr. Epstein, he um, responded pretty promptly to, I mean, it took a second email to follow up, but he, he answered right then after that. That's amazing. Well, keep us up to date with the conversation. I'm really I curious will. about how it goes. So, thank you, Emily, for this very nice presentation. Thanks, everyone.